I started this series in video number one with building an interface to send LocoNet commands to the cloud using the MQTT protocol. In videos number two and number four, I showed how to bring those commands to a mobile device using the Node-RED user interface. I showed how to build a LocoNet viewer and a fast clock display. Today, I'm going to show you how to build additional interface components to make the cell phone LocoNet toolbox looking something like this. A LocoNet viewer, a fast clock display, a switch controller, a service mode programmer, a mainline programmer, and as a bonus, a new setup tool to set the command stations of switches, or at least some of them. Hello YouTubers and welcome to the Internet of Toy Trains. I am Hans Tanner and here is a new episode of IOTT with fresh ideas about how to use the Internet of Things along with sensors and microcontrollers to control a model railroad layout. So, get on board! The train is leaving the station! If you are not familiar with the concepts of the LocoNet to MQTT gateway and MQTT in general, I suggest you start by watching videos number 1, number 2 and number 4 as this current video builds on the content introduced in those videos. I can't imagine sitting somewhere on that layout trying to find the reason for a malfunctioning switch and not having a switch controller available to send closed and thrown commands. And adding one to the Node-RED user interface is actually a piece of cake. All we need is an input field for switch address and buttons to issue thrown and closed commands to LocoNet. An optional checkbox to override the Bushby bit setting may be helpful if you are making use of it on your layout. Building the switch controller is simple. The input fields and buttons feed into a function that stores the values and generates the opcode to be sent to LocoNet via the MQTT interface. Setting up the input fields is straightforward using the available components. I add a topic to them so that I can identify the source of the message later on in the function. The activator buttons, on the other hand, are a little tricky as the LocoNet command set asks for individual messages for switching on and off. When the button is pressed, an on message is sent, followed by an off message when the button is released. Unfortunately, the standard node red button does not expose individual events for pressing and releasing. It only gives a click message after the fact. For this reason, I decided to use a modified version of the HTML button I used for freezing the fast clock in video number 3. I added additional event handlers for press and release, as well as for the mouse, leaving the button area while the mouse button is still pressed. The code generator function finally checks the source of the message. If it is from a data input field, the value is stored but no message issued to LocoNet. If the input comes from a button, the function generates the LocoNet opcode according to the settings and sends it to LocoNet. If the Bushby bit override is set, the message uses the switch acknowledge opcode, otherwise the switch request command is sent. While testing, I found that on some mobile devices, the messages for pressing and releasing always come back to back and time delays between on and off seem not to be possible. This could be a problem if motorized turnouts are used instead of solenoid driven ones. A simple way to solve this problem is to only react to the release event and send both on and off commands at the same time but sending the off command through a delay node of say 500 milliseconds. And with that the switch controller is working. Now for the programmers. Checking the LocoNet PE document, we see that both programmers are managed from slot 7C, decimal 124. And the programmers are described as asynchronous shared system resource, meaning that the program does not have to wait while the programmer is reading or writing a CV, but basically can do other things and then just come back later to get the results. Consequently, this means also that mainline programmer and service track programmer are independent of each other 
and therefore can be used at the same time. For this reason, I decided to make two completely independent user interfaces for them. The operating sequence of the programmers is straightforward. First, we need to send a start task command by writing to slot 124 using the write slot opcode. This command contains information what programmer to use, whether to do a read or write operation, what CV number, and when writing, what CV value. We then get an immediate answer back from the programmer, telling whether the command was accepted and it is worth come back later to get the results, or the command was declined. This information comes in a long acknowledge message. If accepted, the programmer does its thing and when done, updates the slot with the results of the operation and sends a task final reply message using the slot read opcode. So, what we need is input fields for programming method, CV number, CV value for both programmers, as well as read and write buttons to start the programming process. Then we need a listener and a filter for the long acknowledge and slot read messages, followed by display fields for the CV values. The read function is straightforward. The only noteworthy element is the filter for the programmer type. This bit is either set or cleared based on where the data is coming from, mainline or service track programmer. The function looks into this bit to send the data to the correct display field. Here is a quick demonstration of the working programmers. First reading a CV on the service track, then writing it, and then writing a CV to a locomotive on the main track. With the programmers, the Loconet toolbox is now pretty complete. Hopefully, you find it helpful for working on your layout. As always, you can find the complete code on my GitHub page, referenced in the description of this video. In video number 3, I started working on a separate user interface section for elements that are more related to system configuration. As a first component, I placed the setup dialog for the fast clock in there. Today, I'm going to add an editor for the command station op switches. Normally, these switches are configured with the command station in op switch settings mode, but it is also possible to do this remotely as the information is stored in slot 127 or 7F of the command station. To set them, we first need to read slot 127 and store it in memory. Then we need to find and manipulate the bit that corresponds to the op switch. As it turns out, the bits are stored in bytes 3, 4, 5, 6 and 8 and 9 and 10 of the slot. And the most significant bit is always 0. This becomes obvious if we check the op switch list in the DCS manual. Bits 8, 16, 24, 32, 40 and 48 do not exist. In order to prevent the user from setting them to 1, the function filters them out and refuses a change to those bits. In the node red user interface, we place a switch for every op switch we would like to be able to change and add the switch number in the field. When the function receives a change node from any of the switches, it manipulates the corresponding bit and updates the command station slot 127 with the new settings using the slot write opcode. Note that this always writes all op switches, even though only a single op switch was changed. While testing, I noticed that my DCS100 always puts the track to idle state when receiving an op switch status change. For this reason, I have added a go button to the dialog so I can easily restore track power when done with changing the settings. In the example code, I just added switches to set up switch 26, 27 and 41, as these are the ones that I would like to change on a regular basis. Op switch 27 is the so-called Bushby bit. What it does is making the command station refusing switch request commands, which means that it is no longer possible to change switch positions from handheld throttles. 
This is useful when doing an operating session where you probably want to assign different roles to different people and the people controlling locomotives should not be the same as the ones controlling switches and signals. I will talk more about this in future videos, so for the moment this is just a very short introduction. I also added an example showing how to set the combination of several OP switches as OP switch 21, 22 and 23, which together form a value for the default speed step setting of newly assigned locomotives. With these examples, it should be possible for you to add any other OP switch to the node red user interface as needed for your operating style. So, let's summarize. We added a switch controller and programmers for service track and mainline to the Loconet toolset to the node red user interface. With these controllers, it hopefully has become a useful tool to work on the layout finding problems or even do simple support for operating the trains. We added a setup tool for setting the op switches in the DCS command station on the fly, without setting the mode switch to the op's position. Going forward, I will talk a little more about hardware to control signals and switches on your layout. As always, I posted the link to the GitHub page in the description section Below. From there, you can download the node red code presented in this video. If this video is useful or interesting for you, please let me know with a click on the like button or some feedback in the comments section below. Also, stay tuned as more videos will be published in the near future. If you like to be notified when they come out, simply subscribe to the IOTT channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!